Do good work is not a label, but a way of living. It is the constant and diligent effort to achieve a new level of excellence in one's own life. It is the hidden inner beauty behind the struggle to achieve excellence. It's not perfect, but imperfect. It is the effort, discipline, and focus that often goes unnoticed. The goal of Do Good Work is to highlight that drive. The guests I have on this show emulate this drive in their own special way. You'll be able to apply new ideas into your own life by learning from them. We will also have one-on-one episodes with me where we'll dive into my own experience with entrepreneurship and leadership. Every episode is designed to provide you with ideas that you can apply and grow in excellence in all areas of your life, business, and career. Ever wonder what happens when you run LinkedIn's largest account and spend over $130 million on LinkedIn ads? Well, you get a ton of amazing experience, insights, and avenues to help other businesses grow. And that's exactly what AJ did. AJ Wilcox is a LinkedIn ads pro and is founder of B2Link.com, a LinkedIn ads specific ad agency in 2014. He's an official LinkedIn partner host of the LinkedIn Ads Show podcast, and is managed among the world's largest LinkedIn ad accounts. He and his wife live in Utah with their four kids, and his company car is a wicked fast go-kart. We'll talk more about that in the show. He is on the mission to help share his knowledge endlessly in the pursuit of value with LinkedIn. Here are the five things you'll learn on this episode. You'll learn how LinkedIn is evolving as a platform and why you should use it how to use LinkedIn advertising in your marketing mix, how AJ measures key marketing data points and how to set up data so that you can see it, how to train your sales team to nurture leads found from LinkedIn, and finally, how AJ balances running a company and working from home. I hope you enjoy our conversation here today. My man, thanks for being on. I'm super stoked to be here. And just so everyone knows, those who are watching the video, AJ just paused the treadmill. I repeat, pause the treadmill. So I used to have my treadmill here in the office. Would be going maybe two, three miles an hour during work. Uh, but yeah, that's, uh, I'm glad that there is someone as crazy as I am. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, treadmill desk is the way to go. I mean, people talk about standing desks, but when you're standing all day, you, the same muscles are getting fatigued and you find yourself shifting. But on a treadmill, our bodies are meant to walk. So I can walk all day long and not feel it. That's amazing. That's amazing. That would be something that I exactly said. We're just made to walk. We're made to move and got to have the momentum. My man, well, we're talking LinkedIn. We're talking AJ's history, but really the purpose and understanding more like AJ, how did you get here in the LinkedIn world? So just to recap, you know, you know, in the introduction, I talked about your background. However, how did you get from you know, teaching on LinkedIn to managing over 130 million in ad spend. And just so everyone knows, if you manage client accounts, and these are clients who are giving you their money and saying, you know, AJ, I trust you with this money that it's going to return an investment for my business, but 130 million, but plus also handling some of the world's largest accounts. That's, that's no easy feat. So I'd love to know your journey, your story, even from the very beginning. Can you walk us through that? Yeah. So I'll I'll back us up to the point where I've been doing digital marketing for about five years at this point. And I got a job at a local SaaS software company um, here Mm -hmm. in the state of Utah where I'm from. And I go in on my very first day to talk to the CMO, my brand new boss, Mm -hmm. and I lay out all of my digital marketing strategies. And she goes, okay, all that sounds great. Go ahead and execute it. (laughs) But just so you know, we started a pilot with LinkedIn ads about two weeks ago. Can you see what you can do? And I, (laughs) Didn't want to look dumb to my new boss. So I was like, yes, ma'am, absolutely. Saluted and walked out and then went, okay, I've never heard of a LinkedIn ads before. Let's, let's figure this out. Um, Dove in, started trying to invest. And about two weeks later, I had a sales rep uh, come up to me who, who goes, AJ, we don't know what you're doing over here, but we love your leads. Keep it up. Like we're fighting over them. And I went, what's he talking about? So I log into our CRM uh, to look and see like, what are these leads he's talking about? And every single one of them was sourced from LinkedIn ads. Really? And that was not the only ad channel I was running. 
So long story short, I took that as, as the signal, this is good, we should scale this up. And I ended up growing that to become LinkedIn's largest spending account worldwide. Wow. And after running that for two and a half years, uh, surprise, surprise, I ended up getting laid off. So that was like <laughs> what it took to get me into entrepreneurship. But after running the world's largest account for two and a half years, I went, man, I know more about LinkedIn ads than anyone else on the planet. What is the most efficient model to share that knowledge with as many people as possible? And of mm. course, that's an ad agency. So, uh, yeah. No, I want to touch on two things that you said there, and we'll, we'll get on the, the former, but you mentioned value creation and how I can share this value to as many people possible. And that was, obviously, you got to get kicked into entrepreneurship, right? You got kicked into it, right? So that's, that's, that's the difficult piece. But also, you're sharing value that you've learned and created and you're trying to maximize that through the medium of an agency, right? Absolutely. That's the one thing that I've always been good at is helping mm -hmm. other people. And it just so happens that the expertise I had was LinkedIn ads, but my penchant as a person is to help and provide value to as many people as possible. So I, I, I have this goal of being, making the world a better place and the skill I have to do that with is LinkedIn ads. So that's what I'm doing. Uh, but if I would have been, you know, taught some other skill where I'm, you know, world-class at something, then I would have done that too. That's just my goal is to go and make the world better. No, absolutely. And I think that's really key. Like um, the, the, the intentions of starting a specific business does vary in how that business thrives and how that grows with the culture as well as with the clients and how you go day to day. Um, but I want to get back to the very beginning. You kind of walked over it too simple. Like I learned LinkedIn ads and amazing leads, but it wasn't overnight. What were some of the things or the habits that you instilled in order to perfect or have expertise around that certain area that you had no idea, not even your CMO knew? Yeah, I had uh, a position, you know, three, four years, well, it's probably five years before this point um, where all I did all day long was structured people's Google ads accounts. It was called AdWords back then. Mm. And so I have in my mind this, like this account organization, uh, framework. Mm -hmm. And so when I went into LinkedIn ads, I said, okay, I used to bid on keywords. Now I'm bidding to show to audiences. Mm -hmm. What are my similarities here? And I ended up very quickly building an account structure, uh, that felt felt good to me. It felt like everything that all the data I was generating was mm -hmm. helping me categorize and learn more about these audiences, just like mm -hmm. I used to do with keywords. Um, on top of that, I got extremely lucky. I filed a ticket with LinkedIn support because there was some bug. Mm -hmm. And because of me filing that ticket, I had spent enough in just the last couple of weeks at this point where it caught their attention and they said, Hey, these are, this is going to be a good spender. Let's give them a rep. And they ended up giving me LinkedIn's best rep ever. Wow. <laughs> she, she, she's not a rep anymore. Uh, but I mean, she taught me everything I, I know, or at least knew up to that point. Um, she taught me the best ways to bid with LinkedIn ads and the tips and tricks and, and how to aggregate performance. So, so much of what I do, I owe to her still, <laughs> but you know, then I went on and, and uh, over the last you know seven years, I've uh, refined those tactics and built new <laughs> strategies around it. But yeah, that was it. I mean, just a lot of really lucky coincidences, uh, blessings, whatever you want to call them, getting me to the right place. No, that's incredible. And the fact that, you know, having that business relationship or even, even adapting for any listener, even if you're not in the digital marketing space, if you're in the B2B service or B2C service, um, you know, industry, it's creating those relationships and getting that insights. And the fact that you already had previous experience and readapt that into the LinkedIn, LinkedIn piece, I think is pretty pivotal. T, talk to me a little bit. So I, for those who aren't, aren't familiar with some of the terminology, so LinkedIn is a platform for professionals. You log in and you put your profile, you connect with other professionals. When it comes to ad spending, it's those little sponsored messages that we see either on our news feeds that we see on, on social media like Instagram, Facebook, um, you know, Twitter, but also LinkedIn has their own platform for that. And it's been catching on um, as we progress over time, as the technology increases. Can you tell us a little bit more about how LinkedIn in itself as a platform has evolved and where you see it evolving, you know, in the next three years? Yeah. So LinkedIn, ad, uh, LinkedIn ads as a platform, when you compare it to Google and you compare it to Facebook, mm -hmm. it's extremely expensive. And it's also not nearly a, as evolved of a technology as the other platforms. So you might be wondering, like, 
who in the world would ever use LinkedIn ads? Mm-hmm. Well, what we find is uh, it has the best targeting around business professionals out mm-hmm. there. I mean, we can target people by their job titles, their levels of seniority, uh, skills they have listed on their profile, or mm-hmm. even the names of groups they're members of, company name, company size, company industry. And mm-hmm. that's probably only about a fifth or a sixth of everything that's available. Yeah. So the people who win on LinkedIn ads are the ones who are selling uh, high ticket types of services and, and products. Mm-hmm. And they have a specific buyer. Like the only person who can buy this is a decision maker in HR at a company with more than a thousand people at it. Exactly. And so that's where it is. It's very specialized. But when you need to go after a very specific type of business user, this is the platform for that. Yeah. And then uh, you mentioned ad cost as well. And we'll go in diving a little bit into how, how more expensive, relatively speaking, but the higher quality for LinkedIn. Um, but it's also for anyone when you're servicing a market and you're working with customers is knowing exactly who that customer is. And obviously LinkedIn is, is segmenting through demographics through audience, like audience size or company size and who they're going to hit. But also knowing that that's part of the puzzle as opposed to targeting a demographic based on these people who share a common desire, right? Because people who share a common desire may not fit the same demographic targeting that you intend or that you want to box them into. But when it comes to you know, LinkedIn ad costs, what's happening in LinkedIn right now? How is the platform shifting and adapting to what we're seeing in other social media as well as paid ad traffic networks? Yeah, so what we've heard from Facebook advertisers is that because of the whole COVID panic, Mm -hmm. costs dropped by like 30, 40%. Yeah. And because so much of that is driven by business to consumer, Mm -hmm. um, that's what Facebook's so good at. And I was going, okay, come on, LinkedIn. I want to see prices drop over here too. And what we found is average cost per click is somewhere between about 8 to $11 mm-hmm. uh, on LinkedIn. And during COVID, we saw it drop, you know, 5 to 10%. Mm-hmm. But I think business to business money moves a little bit slower. The budgets are a little bit less affected by the, by the pandemic. Yeah. Um, so it's certainly a good time to be investing because we're at a discount. And there's a lot of people paying attention to LinkedIn right now. Mm-hmm. Um, But yeah, if you're looking to close deals tomorrow, um, you know, maybe not, you know, LinkedIn's going to be more of like, (laughs) like start the relationship now for those long sales cycles with big, you know, big deal sizes attached to them. So let's, let's differentiate that. So how do you go about modeling a longer sales cycle with a platform like you would on LinkedIn as opposed to traditional, uh, like more direct response platforms? Yeah, the, I mean, if you're talking about search platforms, like, um, like Google ads, Bing ads and even search engine optimization, like the Mm -hmm. organic side of of search, you're capturing people by the keyword they're typing in. Mm -hmm. And so you can get people who are ready to buy. They're looking for, you know, uh, uh, red shoes. And someone types that in, you go, okay, they're probably ready to buy. Or they're looking for pricing on CRM software. Yeah, the Mm -hmm. intent is telling you everything that you need to know. So you just give it to them. And those are deals that can close tomorrow. But social media, on the other hand, we're not targeting people by what they're looking for right now. Mm -hmm. We're targeting them by who they are and their propensity to be able to make use of what we're selling. Mm. And so we have to understand that the majority of the people who are seeing your ads right now are not in the market to buy your product. And that's okay. What it means is as soon as one of these people are ready to buy, Mm -hmm. uh, you're the first one they're going to think of. And these are giant deals that are, you know, Maybe they take six months or a year to close from when they kind of opt into you. But these are the logos you're going to put on your homepage because you're so proud of working with this company, you know? Yeah, no. When we talk about larger deals, we're talking about anywhere from six to like seven figure type deals on the higher end and also like uh, mid five figure deals. Uh, And that's what LinkedIn's, I would say it's one of the better platforms to connect and find out where those types of buyers are at, but also how to nurture and develop a relationship with them. Oh, yeah. We even find that if you're going to make $15,000 from the lifetime value of a client, Mm -hmm. then LinkedIn ads is probably going to be a home run because you'll end up spending somewhere between about one and four thousand dollars on average Mm -hmm. uh, to get a closed deal. And so if you're making 15 and you only paid you know one to four for it, there's plenty of room to pay a sales rep and an agency to manage it for you uh, and still get profit. So you just talked about a lot of the metrics piece. So when it comes to customer lifetime values for one specific customer that through the lifetime of their relationship with the business, but then you also mentioned, well, from that, let's cut 
you know, sales rep costs, let's cut vendor costs, let's cut agency costs. So how do you help calculate that for customers? Because I know that, I mean, personally, I know that for my clients, when they ask questions, hey, well, how much is it, is it effective to pay this salesperson? How much should we pay for this vendor? Or what's the average cost? And it's always going to be down to the numbers and the metrics of the company. So how do you take those uh, key data points and translate that to a strategy uh, when you're working with customers? Oh man, I, I wish I had a really good answer for this because we have to have a really strong relationship with a client mm-hmm. before they, they ever reveal uh, internal cost structure mm. and even sharing CRM data with us is yeah. oftentimes a stumbling block. So we'll start the relationship from a from what we can track, which is when someone fills out a form on mm-hmm. your landing page, we can see that that form was submitted. And then we're reporting to the client based off of, hey, here's your cost per form fill. Mm-hmm. And after we've built enough rapport with them, Oftentimes they'll ask, hey, you know, our internal goal is actually to get uh, marketing qualified leads or a sales qualified lead, you know, some stage past the form fill. Mm-hmm. Uh, can, can you get us data on that? And we'll say something like, hey, we'll do you one better. If you can get us access to that data, we'll marry it up for you and give you this beautiful report and a dashboard that shows you actively, here's what my cost per every stage of, of for every sales stage process of the conversion. Is. Okay. Exactly. Because to walk through, to, again, to walk through our audience here, you may, this might be very technical. It's someone who sees your ad posting, opts in, and who gives you their name and the email. That's now either a quote unquote lead or at least someone who shows interest. But then from there, perhaps they fill out a form to get on, the, on a call with you. Now that's per, someone who has more intent. Each action that each person takes has a drop off in conversion as well as increase in cost. So when you said that you marry the data through a dashboard, how are you able to now create analysis based on what's happening and what's not happening in, in your customers' accounts? Yeah, so this one, I'm a giant data geek. <laughs> so what we do, and this, this may get a little bit technical, but I'll, I'll kind of race through it. Yeah. Every ad that we create has a unique tracking parameter that based off of the um, how much that ad spends over whatever amount of time, mm-hmm. we are pushing that into a database that we constantly have access to. Hmm. And then everything about that ad, which audience it was targeting, what it said, what the image was, um, whether, you know, if it's in an AB test, whether it was A, whether it was B, what date it was launched, all that we're storing as well. And so as soon as we get from the client, hey, this tracking parameter resulted in this many marketing qualified leads or this many sales qualified leads, Mm -hmm. we can take that data and just through a simple Excel pivot table, uh, tell them exactly here are the campaigns that are performing. So like the audiences uh, mm-hmm. that are low cost or high performance. Uh, here are the ad creatives that are getting people to click or are not converting. So all, all of that data is just, it's, it's beautiful. Uh, it looks like a big jumbled mess to everyone else, but to me it's gorgeous. <laughs> I um, love data, you know, data, again, it's always important to know the pulse and I call it the pulse of the company or the pulse of your initiative so that you're be able to have, multiple streams of information to have an accurate knowledge or judgment uh, in regards to if this is working, this is not working, then you can reason what's the next step, what's the, the thing that I should do, it should stop doing. Now, I want to kind of think more big picture right now. Let's zoom out from the granular data. How does LinkedIn or, you know, in advertising in this particular case on the LinkedIn platform, how does that play a role in the overall foundation or structure of a larger company? Let's, let's, uh, I know that that's a broad question because there's a lot of company size, but let's just say this is a smaller firm around 20, 25 people. So how does LinkedIn ads play a role in the overall structure or the goal of an organization of that size? Oh, I love it. So you ask anyone else in marketing and they'll tell you, oh, we'll generate a high quality lead from your audience. And that's how it plays in. Like Mm -hmm. it's giving you leads. But even more than that, I think uh, this is something I've come to understand over time because LinkedIn gives you such tight targeting over title and seniority and department and company size, mm-hmm. you can then use that to create these little micro segments. So sorry, I, I took us way, way like technical. It's, okay. it's all good. <laughs> <laughs> but, but imagine like this, if your target market is uh, decision makers in IT mm-hmm. at large companies, you could say, well, a decision maker, I mean, that could be a manager, a director, a VP, the CIO or CTO. We mm-hmm. don't know who that is. So we would create, rather than just one big broad audience of just uh, IT um, manager and above seniorities, 
Instead, we'd break that into four separate groups, Ma uh, IT managers, IT directors, IT v VPs, and CIOs and CTOs. And we could serve the same ads to them. We can serve the same offers mm -hmm. across all of them. And over time, you find out, ooh, it looks like directors really like this content and they'll convert. But wow, CIOs, CTOs, they just don't care about us at all. Yeah. And you're learning about what is the motivation through, through your ads, what motivation gets them excited enough to click, which offers do we have that are uh, valuable enough to get someone to say, yeah, I'll give you my email address and name in exchange for this cool mm. report or guide or, or whatever. Yeah. And we're also finding out which of those categories of person are responding. So now we can go back to the company and say, hey, company, we, you told us your audience was this. It's actually a little piece over here and a little piece over here are your ideal. The others might influence the decision some. Here's the content they like, so make more of that. Here's the content they don't care about. Quit making that. And now you're Come steering on. the entire content strategy of the company and you're steering all of the other marketing for now they know who their ideal customer is. Based on relevance. So just that's, I love having data from, even if it's from one marketing channel to have that segue into working with the finance team, working with the content team, working with the marketing team, because if you find out more and more of who you're actually serving in your market, and again, going back to this example of a 25 size uh, person company, so they're doing anywhere from five to 15 million a year. When you're, when you're focusing on that in such a specific way that you can cross uh, pollinate that neck, uh, cross pollinate that information to say, hey, the content team, instead of doing these newsletters or these types of phone calls, this is who you should try target. And that affects an entire department from the marketing side. And that affects the way that, uh, you know, you train your onboarding, your customer service, or even like um, your customer fulfillment side. So that's oh, why yeah. I want to be able to see like how data is even at a very granular level that we just got from using UTM parameters all the way to, this is how I can use it for a bigger strategy, especially for your business owners or those who are um, you know, leaders in your business, being able to see specifically, how can I use all these intel, all these insights, have cross communications across my different teams and not have just silo, um, you know, not just silo AJ on his corner, right? <laughs> but how do I use that and leverage for other areas of the company? Yeah, I mean, anything with tight targeting, you can kind of use it like, like focus groups. I mean, this isn't yes. just something to generate leads. You're getting data uh, surveying people about what they like and what they don't like, and that can dictate everything. And then to your point about how it affects the rest of the organization, if you have a sales team who's used to following up just on leads from, from search channels like Google and Bing, mm -hmm. they're, they're used to picking up the phone and saying, yes, how many do you want? Okay, the order's on the way. Mm. And if they're coming from social channels like LinkedIn and Facebook, you have to train that team to realize, hey, someone downloaded a guide from you on a topic that they care about. That doesn't mean they're ready to buy. So you're not reaching out to close the deal. You're mm -hmm. reaching out to start a relationship or I guess a conversation that turns into a relationship. It is a relationship, right? Yep. Yes. And then that relationship will eventually turn into a sales conversation. But sales guy, you got to wait because uh, they're just not ready for it. They're, you know, someone on the first date isn't ready to be proposed to. No, <laughs> not, not really. No. I, I mean, in your case, you, you probably would. Oh, no, no, I'm just, like, but, uh, <laughs> that's a good joke. No, but that's, I love the fact that training, leverage, cross communications and using Intel and data to make better decisions. But um, let's shift gears a little bit. So AJ, I know that. So right now you're rocking the work at home office. I know I'm rocking that as well. What do you do? I mean, I'm assuming that you have a very busy schedule. So what do you do to have balance in your life and balance with family, with career, with, you know, your hobbies? What are you doing to have balance right now? Oh, man. Uh, I've been working from home for a long time. We have an office, but I find I don't get very much done there because I'm kind of a talker. <laughs> uh, so I, I work from home, you know, this whole time for the last like six years and absolutely love it. Um, it's where I get my best work done. So because I'm working in my home office, uh, it's really hard not to overlap into family time. And it was actually about about two years in, uh, my travel speaking schedule was so crazy. Mm -hmm. um, plus, just my normal work schedule. I mean, clients don't care that you're on the road. <laughs> they, they still want answers to their emails. 
So I, I was just going nuts. And I came home from about a you know two and a half months of straight travel because it was wow. conference season. And my wife was like, uh, I feel like a single mom. And at that point I went, uh, okay, I failed as, as a husband and wow. father. And uh, so that's when I started you know, really changing things. And so for the last couple of years, um, I make a concerted effort. When it hits 6 p.m., mm -hmm. uh, I, I turn the computer off if I can, and I, I go in and do dinner with the family and help put the kids to bed. Um, so I have. I've had to put strict guardrails around it yeah. to make sure I don't ever creep back to that. Because I'm a workaholic. Like, if I were, if I were a single guy, uh, I, I would just work 24 hours a day and, you know, and love every second of it. <laughs> and maybe sleep, right? I, maybe a little bit, yeah. Maybe Fall asleep bit. in between meetings. No, and that takes a lot of discipline, too, that I found is that if you're focused on one particular action, especially in the morning, is getting that done and having the discipline to say, okay, if it's six o'clock, I got to make sure that it's done by then. And you'll find yourself being able to be more productive because you set that intention and that discipline moving forward. I totally agree. I mean, I'm a little bit of a procrastinator, but I do. I need a deadline to make sure that, like, I'm going to work efficiently. What I found is oftentimes I'll have days that are just back to back meetings booked all day long. And I don't feel like I have time to do anything. And then I'll have days with, you know, two, three hour blocks that are nice and open. And I go, oh man, I still didn't get anything done. Cause <laughs> you, you will find something to fill that time with. So exactly. Um, no, exactly. I always like to learn from high achievers, how they're addressing their day. Even if it's looking from some of the top CEOs of the world, how they wake up at 4 AM, they do everything that's starting at eight, like having those blocks for yourself, having those blocks for your family, but also saying, this is the time where I'm going to shut things off and focus on the other aspects of life while my clients are getting success. It's not like neglecting one for the other. It's building leverage so that you can have both, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And then there's also also the weekends. Like, you just make yourself not work on weekends. Dedicate that to the family. Uh, I find my wife feels a lot less resentful when I'm doing that. <laughs> <laughs> I love it, man. Well, before we end, I have one final question, and then we'll ask where people can reach out to you. When you had the intake for the podcast, you mentioned you have a wicked fast go-kart, but you don't take it to the office as often, do you? Or where does this go-kart go? What do you do with this go-kart? So I mentioned that it's my company car, just to kind of be silly, uh, but it's not street legal. Um, the story was when I was growing up, I just, I wanted to drive. I've always been into cars. Yeah. And the closest you can get as a kid, if you don't qualify for a driver's license, is a go-kart. And one summer I saved up, I was delivering phone books, if anyone remembers that. I mean, in yeah. the hot Arizona sun, every day after school, I saved up enough money for this dual engine Honda go-kart that could oh go like gosh. 45 miles an hour. And I show up to the dealership with the cash in hand, like I'm ready to buy. Oh, wow. And the dealership goes, oh, we actually just discontinued that about two weeks ago uh, because of safety concerns. So sorry, we don't have that go-kart anymore. So fast forward about, you know, 15 years, I'm well into my career. Um, I have a driver's license. I own a car, um, but I saw a, a racing go-kart in like the classified ads. And I was like, fulfill childhood dreams, go. And I, <laughs> I, and I went and got it. And then since then I've, I got a side-by-side -side and motorcycles and, and uh, an even faster go-kart. Um, so I, I'm just constantly in the pursuit of speed just to probably fill that hole from when I was a kid. <laughs> So what you're saying is that next time I'm in uh, Utah, we're going to go on that go-kart and get some tacos or something. Oh, absolutely. Next time you're here, trust me, we, we got some <laughs> speed to happen. Oh, I love it. I'm excited, my man. Well, where can people reach out to you and find you? I'm really easy. Our, our website is b2linked.com. Mm -hmm. So if you go to b2linked.com and fill out the form on any of the pages, you won't go to a sales rep and you won't be put into like a marketing nurture you know, anything like that. It just goes directly to my inbox and I'm not a sales guy. So uh, feel free, reach out, <laughs> ask anything you want. I'm an open book. I love it, my man. Well, thanks for being on today. Huge pleasure.